Hey, Hammy here. Uh, today we're going to look at section 8.2 of your chapter, in which talks about human inheritance uh, and some of the disorders and stuff that can happen uh, when chromosomes or genes are messed up. Back when we looked at Mendel and his pea plants and we looked at how things are inherited, a lot of those same things will still apply uh, to humans when we look at genetic traits or traits controlled that are encoded, uh, controlled by genes in our DNA. Uh, they'll have a similar pattern of inheritance. Okay. Uh, first, we want to look at things that have a single gene, so one gene uh, and two alleles, just like tall and short, uh, round and wrinkled, okay, same kind of things that uh, Gregor Mendel was looking at in his pea plants. Some of them, uh, if they're on the first 22 chromosomes, remember we call them autosomes, so we say anything, any of the genes located on the first 22 chromosomes are autosomal traits. Uh, some examples of autosomal, tra autosomal traits would be like widow's peak, okay, where the hair comes to kind of a point on the forehead versus a straight hairline. Okay, you can see me pretty straight, okay, straight hairline, uh, which was actually recessive. Widow's peak is actually dominant over straight hairline. Another example would be hitchhiker's thumb, okay, uh, when you can, you know, when you're hitchhiking, which I think is illegal now, but you okay, see, mine doesn't bend back that far. Mine's just pretty much, pretty much straight up. Okay, some people can really get their thumb uh, to bend at an angle. Uh, some others that you might see would be like attached earlobes or unattached. Although in doing some research, I've I've read that there's actually some variation, and we've been able to tell that in class. You're like, I'm not sure, is it attached or not? Uh, we actually think that maybe that's not just a single gene trait. Uh, some other things I've read sometimes is uh, the ability to roll your tongue. Okay. Some people can do that, some can't. Some people claim that that's a single gene trait, and others can't. Some say that it's learned. Uh, but those are some of the examples. Uh, these two are very common uh, that you'll see on tests or examples in textbooks. One thing we need to mention uh, before we get too far here into inherited traits is how we represent them or how we show them on paper. And that's done through the use of pedigrees. Uh, and you've, if you've raised dogs or animals, you may have talked about pedigrees. Uh, this comes from a good line or a champion line or this kind of thing. It's, it's a diagram that we keep track of family history of certain traits. Okay, this can be done with humans as well. And some key characteristics of a pedigree, uh, you'll notice that squares represent males, circles, females. Okay, so where you have a circle and a square and then a horizontal line, and then a line coming down, okay, that re represents mom, okay, dad, and then kids, okay? So then this would be a daughter, and this would be a son. Now, if they're clear, not shaded in, that means that it's they're not affected, whereas if they're shaded in, that means they're affected with that trait, okay, or they're showing that trait, okay? Uh, some other things sometimes you might see, what's that? Two lines coming from the same point, okay, that represents twins. Uh, sometimes you may see, if we extend this line a little bit, uh, you may see a dashed line, okay? A dash line usually represents an adopted son or daughter. It okay, would be shown as a, uh, and a kind of a dash line there. Uh, so this, you could follow back through a family history. If you were looking at traits, uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit here, how genetic counselors use that uh, for risks and so forth, and trying to figure out what the trait is and where it came from and how it's inherited. Okay, if they're not an autosomal trait, which is on the first 22 pairs of chromosomes, if they're on that 23rd pair, remember we call those sex chromosomes, uh, we say they are sex-linked, or more often than not, we've talked about this in the previous video, we call them X-linked traits, and they often have a different pattern of inheritance. If we take hemophilia, for example, uh, which is a X-linked trait, uh, if we put 
uh, like a capital H as normal allele and a little h as a hemophilia allele, uh, we can see that females that are XX, a lot of times if they have a recessive gene for hemophilia, which would cause the disease, uh, they often will have a normal allele to cover it up. Whereas males are XY, so if they inherit a hemophilia gene, okay, now they're going to show that trait because the other chromosome is a Y and they don't have a uh, kind of a normal gene to cover that up. So when we look at pedigrees, one thing that you can notice if you're asked to figure out uh, what is being shown in this pedigree, you'll see that some of these, uh, the females tend to be shaded half and half. A lot of times that's representing a female that is a carrier. So they have an X with a normal gene and an X with the trait gene. Okay. So in the inheritance, uh, you could jot down here for inheritance in X-linked traits, females tend to be carriers and it tends to be more prevalent or it tends to show up in males because again, they only have that one X chromosome. So if you look at the pedigree here, who's the completely shaded in ones? Okay, they're all males. And they tend to, you can also jot down, they tend to skip generations. Okay, so here you have a mother who's a carrier. Okay, we'll pass it then to her son. Okay, uh, his sons will be normal. Okay, so you'll never have you'll never have a father that has an infected or affected son. Okay, because they're passing on their Y chromosome. Their daughters, however, okay, an affected male has a 50/50 chance of having a carrier female. Okay, so it goes carrier female to having an affected son to a carrier female, to having an affected son. So you can jot down too that it tends to skip generations, okay, where the daughters will be carriers and then their sons uh, in the next generation, it tends to show up. You get about a 50-50 chance depending on which X that son inherits. So some kind of interesting things that you can figure out these pedigrees. When you look back through them, you can figure out how a trait is inherited by who uh, is showing uh, the symptoms and who is not. Okay, moving on to things that are maybe not Mendelian uh, inherited the way Mendel sort of described it. Uh, for example, multiple alleles. Uh, this is where it's controlled by more than two alleles, uh, but make a note here, there is still just one gene. Okay, so one gene, but more than two alleles. An example that we've talked about in previous chapters is our ABO blood group. Okay, our ABO blood group. Okay, you can actually have four different phenotypes, but a lot more genotypes. Okay, they code for proteins on the surface of the cell. Okay, so to be type A, and we often use I's because it's an autosomal trait, not an X-linked trait. So you'll to be type A, you can have two A alleles, or you can have an A allele, and then a, we do a lowercase I, which represents O or no protein on it on the blood cell. To be type B, you can have a B allele, a B allele, or you can have a B allele and a type O allele, okay? Uh, then to be type AB, you can probably figure this one out, right? You have, it's also codominant. So if you have one of each allele, you'd be type AB. And to be type O, you have to have kind of two recessive alleles for no protein. So if you count, you have one, two, three, four, five, six genotypes, six genotypes, but only four phenotypes, okay? And so this gives us this kind of this wide range because you have more than two alleles. You have an A allele, a B allele, or an, a type I, which is no protein, or type O allele. So you have three alleles for that one gene, and that gives us a variety of phenotypes. Sometimes a trait is controlled by more than one gene. Okay, now when this happens, we call it polygenic. Poly means many genes. 
polygenic, many genes. Uh, and they usually have kind of an additive effect. So the more dominant alleles you have, okay, the, the more it's going to show up. Uh, if we look at uh, s skin color in humans, okay, you have three genes. And the more dominant alleles you have, so if, you, if you're like big A, big A, big B, big B, big C, big C, okay, if you've got all dominant alleles, those are going to be sort of the most melanin production. They're going to be the darkest individuals. Whereas down here, you'll have little A, little A, little B, little B, little C, little C. Okay, These will be your very fair-skinned individuals, Okay, hardly any melanin. Okay, and then you notice you have this wide range or combination of alleles in between. Okay, if we graph that out, uh, if we went across the United States and sort of graphed out everybody's sort of skin color, we'd probably get or even go around the whole world, all seven some billion people. You'll often see kind of what we call a bell-shaped curve, okay, where most people will be sort of this average skin color, uh, kind of this medium tone, uh, when then very, you know, small percentage of very, very light colored people and very, very dark colored people. So we get this wide range. Um, sometimes in class we'll graph everybody's height, okay, in all the biology one classes. Uh, height would be another polygenic trait controlled by many genes. Okay, now notice most people would be an average height. You'd have a few really tall people and some really, really short people. Okay. And we see that over here. And we can actually, if you do this with for women versus men, you'll see kind of a different bell curve where the average height for male is a little bit more than the average height for female. Okay. Now, understand that polygenic traits and a lot of these traits can also be under environmental uh, influence. Okay. In other words, skin tone, you might have alleles for a lighter shade, but if you spend a lot of time in the sun, okay, it's going to stimulate more melanin production. Uh, height, we found the average height in society going up, most likely because of better nutrition. So you might have the genes for some of those things, but uh, if you're not in the right environmental, this is ENV, environmental conditions, uh, those genes might not be shown to their potential. Okay, one of the last two things we want to discuss here as far as how things are inherited is this idea of pleiotropy. Okay, this is where one gene will code and control the phenotype or expression of several different unrelated traits. Okay, so uh, when you have a gene, it, it's not like the melanin gene where depending on how many uh, leos you have, how dark or lighter your skin is. Uh, when something goes wrong with one of these genes, uh, for example, Marfan's, Marfan syndrome, uh, which is uh, messes up an enzyme, okay, it actually ends up affecting several different phenotypes, okay, not just like skin tone. Uh, they have this sort of uh, indentation in their chest cavity, okay, it kind of gives them sort of these clubbed tipped fingers, uh, it causes dilation of the aorta. Okay, so you have these very sort of different phenotypic expressions uh, that come from just one gene that's messed up. Uh, another example would be PKU, phenylketonuria, okay, which is just an, uh, a, a mutation in a gene which helps break down the amino acid phenylalanine. Okay, and, but that defective enzyme causes high levels of phenylalanine, and that in turn causes kind of this wide range of uh, phenotypic uh, expressions. Uh, thinking problems, behavior problems, uh, it affects different body systems. Uh, so pleiotropy is when one gene uh, can kind of affect a wide range of different phenotypes and body systems and tissues and so forth. Uh, finally, we have this one called epistasis. Okay, epistasis is where one gene can actually affect the expression of a, one, another gene or a bunch of other genes. Uh, for example, if you look at the agouti color uh, in mice, which is kind of this, this brownish color right here, uh, normally that agouti color or the brown is dominant over black. So you have big B, little b. So if you do a diet, if you kind of do a cross here, 
uh, hybrid cross between Big B, Little B, Big B, Little B, they noticed that, okay, it should be a three to one ratio. So they got brown, 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 brown. Anywhere there's a Big B, they got brown, okay? But, and then anywhere they had Little Bs, they had black mice. However, they also got these albino mice and they wondered what is going on here, okay? Well, there's actually a second gene, the A's here, okay? The A gene affects whether there is pigment even made, okay? So if you have little a, little a, you can see down here, little a, little a, there will be no pigment, so the mouse will be white. No matter what those other genes are, that gene, if there's no pigment, those other genes don't matter because it can't be brown or black because there's no pigment. So you actually get uh, four albino mice, the four that show little a, little a, when you do kind of this dihybrid cross with both genes. And we worked through a similar example in class uh, with the Labrador retrievers, right? You had black and chocolate, but then you can also get the yellow lab if there is another gene that prevents the expression of that pigment. So a very similar situation. Okay, scientists knowing how a lot of these diseases are passed on and by looking at pedigrees, uh, they are geneticists that specialize in helping families look at the risks. Okay, these are called genetic counselors and they look back through your family history and try to figure out maybe who uh, carried a trait or who was affected by a trait and they try to build pedigrees and they help uh, future parents look at the risk. If you know you're carrying something like Huntington's disease or hemophilia or sickle cell trait, something like that, uh, they will help the family look at those pedigrees and say, what is your risks? Um, what is your risk in having kids? Um, will it be passed on? Will it not? Um, <clears throat> so the obvious, you know, the use of pedigrees of the family history are very important. Uh, if, if someone if a couple does become pregnant, another thing they can do is called amniocentesis. Okay, amniocentesis is prenatal, so before the baby is born. Okay, so you see the baby in the womb down here. Here's, they're doing an ultrasound right here. Uh, they can actually take some of this fluid right here, which will contain. So they put a long needle through the belly, uh, into the through the uterine wall, and they, they extract some of this amniotic fluid right here. And it often has some of the fetal cells in it and they can then look at the fetal chromosomes and they can examine them and find some traits like down syndrome and that sort of thing which we can't really cure uh, but it can help the parents better prepare if, you know if we know, if i know uh, that my uh, newborn is going to have down syndrome uh, we i can you know sometimes it involves counseling uh, how do you prepare sometimes just people to teach the parents uh, how to better care or PKU or something like that. Uh, we don't want to give them this formula or that formula. We need to do special things. And it really helps start development off on the right foot uh, if we kind of know some of those disorders uh, before the baby is born. Some of the kind of in the pipeline type things, although they're doing some of this already, uh, is this idea of gene therapy. So if I know I'm carrying a certain trait uh, or uh, we do prenatal testing. We find out that there's a genetic disorder. Uh, they're starting a lot of therapies, which they will take uh, stem cells from the patient, okay, and they'll try to take a working copy of the gene. So whatever is defective in in uh, the patient, uh, they'll take a working copy of the gene, put it in what we oftentimes call a retrovirus, uh, which will actually kind of work backwards. So take out the bad virus type genes and put a good copy of the gene in, try to infect that stem cell with that virus. So here comes the DNA right here, is being inserted and incorporated into that stem cell. So there's a good working copy of the gene. And then we try to put that stem cell, okay, we try to put that stem cell uh, back in the, in the patient and try to get a good response and get that a good gene working again. Uh, so there's a lot of genetic diseases, cancers, uh, those types of things uh, that gene therapy holds a lot of promise uh, for curing and fixing some of these genetic disorders we've talked about.